Welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us for our presentation, Vegetarian Soft Capsules Achieving High Yields and Efficient Production Through Raw Material Selection. I'm Fran Schoenwetter, Director, Content Marketing with Informa Markets, Health and Nutrition, and Vita Foods Insights. I'm your host and moderator for today. Our webinar is brought to you by DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences, world leader of innovative and sustainable solutions across food, health, pharma, and biotech industries. Our presenter today is Benjamin Roscoe, Application Development and Innovation Manager, Pharma Solutions for DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences. Benjamin has been with DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences platform since 2017. As an application development and innovation manager, he supports global commercialization, new product development, and technology transfer for dietary supplement products. Before DuPont, Ben, ben spent five years with FMC Health and Nutrition, where he gained extensive hands-on experience, providing technical customer support with non-animal capsule systems. Before we begin, the actual presentation today, I thought I would just provide a few words about this webinar technology for you all. This platform allows you to watch this event the way that you want to watch it. Please feel free to customize the webcast console. You can move windows around by dragging on the title bar or resizing your windows by clicking on the lower right corner of any window. You will notice a toolbar at the bottom of your console and these buttons allow you to open and close widgets on your screen. Our webinar today is live, and we will be responding to your questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar. Uh, they will be addressed again at the end. Uh, if we're unable to get to specific questions due to time constraints, those will be supplied to the presenter, and efforts will be made later to directly respond. While viewing the presentation, uh, just keep in mind if your screen changes, occasionally that happens but rarely hit F5 on your PC and command R on your Mac. Now you can download those presentation slides from today in a PDF format by clicking on the folder icon on your screen. You can do this during the webinar. It won't interrupt any part of the presentation at all. So now on to our presentation. As noted earlier, our topic today addresses product production with vegetarian and soft gel capsules and achieving high yields and efficient production through raw material selection. Addressing the general consumer trend towards clean label and non-animal sourced products, the dietary supplements industry has begun shifting away from gelatin and soft gel capsules toward plant-based soft capsules. Various established veggie soft capsule technologies represent a sufficient but frequently not ideal combination of soft capsule quality, manufacturing efficiency, and yield. In this webinar, vegetarian soft gel formulations are compared on the basis of suitability to form superior quality products and achieve high efficiency production. During our webinar, there will be several audience survey questions that will get pushed out to you. Uh, we really please do encourage you to engage and respond to those surveys. We'll see and discuss the results in real time. And with that, we'll begin. Welcome, Ben. Hi. Hello, and thank you for that introduction. Um, so in this webinar, uh, as we mentioned, vegetarian soft capsule shell formulations are compared on the basis of suitability to form superior quality products and achieve high efficiency manufacturing conditions. So with that, let's jump in. Uh, so here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, first, we'll start with a look at the vegetarian market opportunity. Next, we'll provide an overview of the various available vegetarian soft capsule technologies. Then we'll discuss the present study where a vegetarian soft capsule system is evaluated to understand quality and how to address efficiency and yield challenges. We will review the materials and methods as well as the results that were observed. And we'll finish up with some brief discussion, conclusions and takeaways. But before we jump in to the marketing piece, we'd first like to ask a marketing question. That is, how would you estimate the vegetarian soft capsule market growth over the next five years? 
So please select one of the listed answers and we'll review the results together in a moment. Will it likely slow down? Will it continue at around the same pace as today? Or will it further accelerate? So let's see. Maybe I'll progress. All right. So if you can see this, it looks like uh, the respondents are saying that it will um, likely further accelerate. So, okay, that's, that's good to hear um, and pretty insightful. So let's wait for another half a second and okay. Let's see what we're, take a look at where we're seeing at DuPont. All right. So if it will continue to accelerate, where we are, what we see today is that the capsule market size is approximately $2.4 billion, growing at a rate of around 9% annually. Um, as seen in the graph on the left, a significant portion of this market is pharmaceuticals, but dietary supplements and other segments are growing more rapidly. This is a marketplace that has traditionally been dominated by animal-based gelatins, but consumer demand has begun to shift toward plant-based or non-animal soft capsules. This split is described in the second graph. The third graph describes the growing number of label claims for recent dietary supplement soft gel product launches. Since there has also been a great increase in the number of people who identify as vegan or vegetarian, such shoppers have made an impact by their tendency to purchase more supplements and preference for specific health claims. So as a result, formulating with plant-based options additionally broadens the available consumer base while allowing brand owners to address a variety of dietary preferences, including clean label, non-GMO, halal kosher, vegan, vegetarian, and so on. Now let's take a look at the existing soft capsule technologies. So this is a quick review of what's available today. And this revealed that seaweed-derived carrageenan plus starch is the most likely combination of film-forming biopolymers used to produce non-animal soft capsules. For each system that was reviewed, both ingredients were observed to be listed as either the primary or secondary film-forming polymers. Of course, there are differences between the various technologies due to different carrageenan type, that is iota, kappa, and or kappa-2 chemistries, as well as the starch source. For example, cornstarch, potato, or tapioca. Since there are a lot of technologies that do utilize both carrageenan and starch, the following techniques may be helpful for manufacturers to understand the quality of ingredients and resolve any production challenges when it comes to producing non-animal soft capsules. So you may be wondering, what's the challenge? Next, we're gonna dive into a recent study where a vegetarian soft capsule system is evaluated to understand quality and how to address efficiency and yield. But again, before we do, we want to ask the audience a technical question. So that is, what do you believe to be the main limitations of today's vegetarian soft capsule technologies compared to animal-based gelatin soft capsules? And in this instance, you may select more than one answer. Is it lower encapsulation speeds, lower ceiling strengths, higher cost in use, or general difficulty to use slash challenges with consistent functionality? So let's wait another moment for a few responses to come in and we'll take a look. Okay, so I'll progress the slide. All right, we're getting some nice mixed feedback here um, with some consensus around just difficulties to use, lower ceiling strength and lower encapsulation speeds being uh, second, third, and fourth, with higher cost in use being the concern that is the, the primary. Um, concern here. 
So it seems like some of these issues are interrelated, right? And there, some respondents are saying that the, the difficulties with ceiling strength and general challenges with um, using the technology um, are, are challenges here. And um, we hope to show that by addressing um, some of the vegetarian soft capsule process parameters and uh, that improvements to the ceiling strength uh, can enable um, faster speeds and easier to use formulations, which will then ultimately reduce that cost in use. So let's, let's uh, dive into some of the technical aspects and hopefully we can address some of these points here. Perfect. So as was mentioned at the outset, vegetarian soft capsule technologies today do represent a sufficient but frequently not ideal combination of quality, manufacturing efficiency, and yield. Importantly for non-animal film systems, starch activation is critical to achieve uh, the optimal encapsulation performance, often complementing film forming mechanisms of other polymers like carrageenan. The type of starch and or carrageenan used, as well as how the gel mass and then films are prepared are key considerations during manufacturing. Uh, therefore, understanding the hydration and activation of these components is really critical to ensure that we're preparing high quality soft capsules every time. So considering these points, our problem statement or question that we want to answer becomes, can we characterize vegetarian soft capsule materials and films to ensure that we're producing excellent soft capsule quality, achieving manufacturing efficiency and high yields? In the subsequent slides, we'll review that recent study aimed at answering that very question. Our materials, the samples that we used in this study were selected at each stage of the soft capsule manufacturing process, from starting raw materials to the intermediate wet film samples and the final soft capsules themselves. Methods. The test procedures we used in this study include staining, optical microscopy, wet film tensile testing, and soft capsule leakage tests. Staining and optical microscopy can be used to characterize non-animal um, raw materials and films to visually identify the components such as carrageenan and or starch. Um, optical microscopy can then be used to assess the quality for the presence of undissolved or poorly hydrated materials. <clears throat> Solution cast films are often used to predict the performance in soft capsule applications where film mechanical properties can be used to evaluate and then compare the corresponding uh, soft capsule leakage results. And in this case, we tested, um, we produced 36 encapsulation trials and evaluated both wet film tensile testing and soft capsule leakage. So let's take a look at some results, starting first with the staining and optical microscopy. So let's take a look at carrageenan as a raw material. <clears throat> we can see that under normal light, unstained carrageenan appears to have a fibrous um, appearance. When we apply polarized light to the sample, it has little to no effect. However, when we apply methylene blue, which is a particular type of stain, it associates with the anionic, anionic hydrocolloid and we observe a chromatic shift from light blue to deep purple, which is seen in the bottom left. Whereas application of an iodine stain, as seen in the bottom right, elicits no reaction from the carrageenan. <clears throat> Next, let's take a look at pure starch as a raw material. Under normal light, pure starch presents as small groups of similar, similarly sized granules. It may be difficult to see from the picture in the top left, but these small granules can sometimes clump together and present as aggregated clusters. 
Applying polarized light to the sample highlights a crystalline pattern of the individual granules uh, that look like an X or a type of cross. Uh, as seen in the top right, especially that zoomed in section that we've highlighted, uh, that crystalline pattern is apparent as that cross or X in the middle of the granule. Upon introduction of the methylene blue stain uh, and iodine stains on the bottom of the slide, it becomes possible to um, identify that starch has a chromatic shift from dark purple to red upon application of the iodine stain, but it does, has no reaction with methylene blue. So conversely to the carrageenan raw material we just took a look at. The differences in raw materials become much more apparent when we evaluate a blend of materials. In the top left image, it's difficult to detect the presence of both carrageenan and starch in that image. And by applying polarized light in the top right, uh, we can again see the crystalline pattern of the starch material start to appear. But upon introduction of methylene blue in the bottom left and iodine stain in the bottom right, it becomes possible to clearly identify the presence of carrageenan and starch respectively. This is because the methylene blue stain um, really only associates with polymers like carrageenan, and that's why in the bottom left you can start to see those purple domains start to appear. And then uh, the iodine stain reacts strongly with starch, as can be seen in the image in the bottom right. All right. Now let's take a look at some intermediate process samples. That is the wet films used to form the soft capsules. The order of the images in these subsequent slides is a bit different as we're comparing optimally, optimally prepared films at the top versus uh, inadequately fi prepared films at the bottom. Um, so st starting in the top left, uh, visual observation of the films under normal light without stain can be helpful to characterize um, the films and screen for any excess oil or debris that may have occurred during the manufacturing process. By applying uh, polarized light, we can highlight if there are um, any unshattered or poorly activated starch granules that appeared. Typically, there should be few to no starch granules observable in swatches of optimally prepared gel films uh, as you can see in the top right, whereas large clusters and or a high distribution of individual unshattered starch granules are typical in undermixed gel film systems, as can be more so seen in the bottom, bottom right. <clears throat> Next, let's take a look at some stained films. On the left-hand side, we show some films that have been stained with iodine solution, which, as we discussed, highlights the presence of starch. And in this case, in the top left, we're, we're looking for a high density of shattered starch particles, which hopefully, hopefully you can see um, dispersed throughout that, um, that swatch sample. On the bottom, as seen in the bottom left, an inadequate mixing process can result in limited starch activation with a low density or absence of shattered starch particles detectable. <clears throat> film stained with methylene blue solution will indicate the distribution of carrageenan in the gel film system. Inadequately mixed gels, as seen in the top right, a homogeneous distribution of carrageenan is typical. However, methylene blue stain will have uh, little to no effect within domains that do not contain carrageenan, such as undermixed gels or carrageenan-free systems, as seen in the bottom right. Finally, let's take a look at encapsulation and the encapsulation results that were observed. For each of the 36 encapsulation trials performed on our pilot scale equipment, we sampled the films to evaluate their mechanical properties, as well as calculated the percent capsule leakers after drying. The output for each film tensile test was a forced distance curve. That is the film, uh, the distance the film traveled before breakage and the strength that it took to break that film. 
The results were further quantified by integrating the area under the curve. Um, and the data is, the data outputs listed in the middle of the slide under the film tensile data header. And an example of the data curves that were collected is shown in the top right image. And those are the force distance curves that I mentioned. Capsule leakage was also calculated as a percent of the batch that failed after drying. The average data collected is listed on the left, showing an average of approximately 1% 1 1 uh, leakers overall. Uh, but it ranged from down to 0% leakers in the batch up to around 8% leakers. Now that we've gone through the results, let's take a deeper dive at and look at some of the, the data in a little more, in a little more detail. Um, <clears throat> here we've grouped the uh, soft capsule percent leaker data for each of the 36 encapsulation assessments into strong and weak film groups. These groupings relate to the tensile data of the films that we used to form the respective soft capsules. We can see that soft capsules made with strong films had an average percent leaker response of around 0.1%, whereas soft capsules made with weak films had an average percent leaker response of around 2.1%. The difference between the two groups, considering their standard deviation, was st uh, statistically significant, and we believed relevant to soft capsule uh, use in commercial formulations. So the takeaway here is that stronger films do lead to superior capsules. But how can we ensure that we're making strong films? We did discuss that fully activating the starch and hydrating the carrageenan polymers can lead to higher quality films. So that's one way. But let's explore that in greater detail in the next slide. So taking a quick look at a related study that we conducted a few years ago, where we made minor adjustments to the soft capsule, soft capsule shell formulation and evaluated the corresponding film tensile properties using the same film puncture test as was previously described for this present study. The outcomes can be seen in the response surface graph on the right, um, which may be difficult to interpret, but I'll walk through the results. This shows that Adjustments to the carrageenan concentration had a significant impact on the tensile properties of the films. Ranging from reducing area under the curve when there was less available carrageenan, when you go down in that graph, to providing stronger films when there was more available carrageenan, as when you go up in that graph. Whereas adjustments to the starch and plasticizer had less of an effect. So from this, we get the impression that more carrageenan, or to phrase it differently, better hydrated, more available carrageenan, can indeed lead to stronger films. So to summarize what was covered uh, previously, seaweed-derived carrageenan plus starch are the most likely combination of film-forming biopolymers that are currently used to repair non-animal soft capsules. <clears throat> Through a combination of staining and microscopy techniques, these materials and the intermediate wet film samples can be characterized to provide a strong impression of quality and inform the optimal manufacturing process that's established to ensure the production of superior quality vegetarian soft capsules. Oops. Uh, to conclude, we can use film stain. We, we reviewed that we can use film staining and microscopy to examine vegetarian soft capsule film formers to achieve fully hydrated carrageenan and excellent activation of starch. The use level of carrageenan and starch can impact the film tensile properties. Importantly, we discussed that more carrageenan or more available carrageenan can lead to stronger films whereas weaker films tended to lead to a greater failure rate, uh, that is, lower yields, whereas stronger films resulted in superior capsule performance. So it follows that by understanding the nature of starting materials and how to optimally process them, the quality of intermediate samples like wet films 
can be maintained and result in stronger ceiling capsules, that is better yields, and the ability to encapsulate more efficiently and at faster RPMs. You can learn more about DuPont's vegetarian soft capsule technology and our other dietary supplement offerings by following this link or the links in your resource section of your webinar page. Before we wrap up for Q&A, we'd like to ask one final polling question. That is, what products would you like to see in a vegetarian soft capsule format? And in this case, you may choose more than one answer. Vitamins and minerals, botanical or herbal supplements, essential fatty acids, CBD, or probiotics. So let's take wait for a moment for um, results to come back in and then we'll review together. <clears throat> All right. Let's see here, we've got a, a good distribution actually. Um, so looks like botanical and herbal supplements as well as essential fatty acids are um, pretty much tied for the most popular um, and fo followed closely by vitamins and minerals and probiotics and then CBD. I, I think that CBD and probiotics, well, CBD was a trend a couple, maybe last year. So surprised to see that that's sort of becoming less, uh, maybe less popular. Maybe that's a sign of that it, it waning and probiotics perhaps is on the rise. And then the, the tried and true products um, seem to be top of the list again. So I think I'll hand it back over to our moderator to um, moderate the Q&A and um, <laughs> say thank you for participating. Thank you, Ben. All right, back to you, Fran. Yeah. I was uh, just uh, thinking about some of what we saw in that last survey result slide and uh, doing quite a bit of content on hemp and hemp CBD. And as far as waning, I think it's more like a wait and see with that category right now because I think there's a, just a, some degree of uncertainty in terms of regulations, access points, and then probably also cost related to encapsulating products too for a lot of the smaller companies. So that'll That's be interesting. Very good point. Yeah. And also those results all seem to be reflective of where they're, you know, where your customers are, are seeing that market opportunity. Um, fatty acids and botanicals. So we have quite a few uh, questions here. We'll try to get through them. Um, first, um, maybe a couple of um, sure. just methodology questions that were directly related to your presentation slides. Um, so there were just, yeah. uh, I'm just gonna kind of pull these all together, these three questions. Um, uh, how are the stains applied to the films? And if you could also, tell us what probe was used for the film tensile data in slide 16, which you can click on if you want to, uh, in your view, click on 16 to, to look at that. Let me try. And, yeah. Okay. And also, are there maybe, and is there any impact uh, to a mix of plasticizers? So how are the same sure. applied to films? Probe used and mix impact of mix of plasticizers. Right, sure, no problem. Uh, the stains were prepared um, as separate solutions and then put in little bottles with a, and then used a little um, a pipette or a little pipette to remove a small amount and having a, a glass slide with some of either the raw material or the film swatch cut out we applied a little bit of that stain and then um, put it under the microscope. If there is excess, we could use a little wipe to remove the excess, just blot it away, and then uh, directly look at it under the microscope. So it's really applied 
directly before observation of the sample under the microscope. Um, and the microscope that we were using is equipped with a polarized light filter. So that is how we were able to generate the images that included polarized light. Um, in this... all right. I'm sorry, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> no, I was trying to remember your second question around the- Oh, the second one was um, whether there is an impact uh, if mixing plasticizers. Right. Um, yes, you can certainly mix plasticizers to achieve uh, different capsule hardnesses. That's uh, that's really what what's done. Um, the non-animal systems that we've worked with function very similarly um, with multiple plasticizers as with uh, animal-based gelatin. Uh, in that you can, we typically will use glycerin um, when when we can uh, in my application lab, just because we can. We bought a we buy a big drum of it and, and use it up. Um, but mixing with sorbitol special um, can be done to achieve <clears throat> different capsule hardnesses. You can also use, you can switch out all the glycerin for sorbitol special and get a very hard capsule or mix it 50-50 to get something that's more in between. Um, but it works well in the systems. And then I believe there was a, a question about probe and the probe that we used uh, for the tensile tests right here. Um, it's uh, the rig that we mount the film onto. It's a bigger swatch that we cut this this time, probably about that big. And we'll place it on a, a rig and then use a ball probe to press through the film. And um, that gives us a force distance response, which is uh, pictured there on the slide. All right. Um... There. Let's go on to um, uh, sort of a little farther down in the process here. Um, can you tell us what the ceiling temperature looks like? I'm sorry, the, the ceiling? ceiling? Yeah, temperature. ceiling temperature. Yes. Sure. Yes, no problem. Um, relative to animal gelatins, where the ceiling temperatures are... Um, uh, tend to be a little bit lower, maybe in the, the 30 to 40 Celsius range. Um, we're, we're more so looking in the, the 60 to um, 60 to 65 Celsius range. So, it, and it, it's really dependent upon your process speed. Um, so just, I'm speaking in generalities here. That because, was my next um, question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So um, we're really, it's, it's a hermetic seal that we're forming around the soft capsule, very similar to an animal gelatin soft capsule. It's the same rotary die process. Um, you can see an, an image of our um, pilot machine right here in the bottom right. So it's very, very similar to what's used in animal gelatin. Um, we can actually use the same equipment in our application lab to make gelatin soft capsules. Um, but if you are running the machine slower, you need less temperature to achieve that same level of melt on that film. Um, whereas if you're running it faster, you, you might need to turn up the temperature because there's less dwell time of that film under the die or under the edge. So higher temperatures are sometimes required when you want to achieve very fast RPMs. Um, but we've seen this C-gel technology, it's my point of reference. Um, we've seen it run at speeds that are um, the same as gelatin. Well, does that vary with at all with what's being encapsulated? There's a question here about whether there are specific challenges with encapsulating uh, mixed or complex formulations where you have uh, different deliverables in the payload uh, in terms of their, their format and their composition. Um, does that, are there particular challenges related to the, the vegetarian soft gel specifically for that that kind of complexity right uh good question certainly um i think you'll find that the challenges in encapsulating the more difficult film materials tend to follow the same process capability um troubleshooting as just as with a gelatin soft capsule it's really um just the nature of the process not not necessarily the system. Mm -hmm. um, certainly encapsulating a light oil 
is very easy and straightforward with any vegetarian soft capsule system. Uh, whereas you really want that high quality superior seal when you're forming um, a seal with a, a difficult fill material, something complex, it's maybe an oily suspension, tend to be the higher value products. Um, and, and that's where you really want a high quality vegetarian soft gel system. Think about using, you wouldn't use a low bloom gelatin to make your you know, difficult multivitamin paste. And, and the same relationship goes for the type of vegetarian soft capsule material that you'd select for those difficult fills. Understood. Thank you for that. And um, so it seems yeah. like you have to work with that on a case by case basis to some degree. Um, there's a question here related to bioavailability comparison to regular gelatin capsules. I, I think that's really more asking about how it's broken down, but I, I actually want to combine that with, a, um, sure. with also asking you about um, uh, just sort of the organoleptic experience uh, by the consumer, um, you know, in terms of yes. swallowability and a lot of the reasons people prefer to take gel, soft gel caps versus other formats. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the vegetarian soft capsule um, consumer experience is very similar to the expected consumer experience if you're referencing an animal-based gelatin soft capsule. That is, it gets slick when the consumer puts it in their mouth. It is very, uh, which lends itself to um, being easily swallowed. So it still presents a good opportunity for um, that dysphagia, difficulty swallowing type of um, market. Um, and the bioavailability of the capsules are um, immediate release, right? So they'll, they'll release readily when they hit the gastrointestinal tract and um, all the contents of the capsule will come out within you know, 10 minutes, um, just as a gelatin soft capsule will and what the expected release profile will be like for um, a soft capsule dose form in general will, can be found with vegetarian soft capsules. Now, those that tend to be more uh, heavier on starch um, tend to be more challenged in releasing the fill material within um, that period of time. And I think it's just because it takes longer for the body to uh, break down that starch shell. All right. That's just purely a, purely a, a, a digestive consideration. Um, sure. Yeah. Let's uh, just circle back a little bit more on manufacturer here. Um, related to melting temperature of sea gel, um, is there, uh, you know, what's, what is the mixing power or pressure uh, uh, re required for, for manufacturer? Do you mean uh, preparation of the, the gel that yeah, is used I to think, make the shell? Yeah, the question is about the temperature of sea gel. Yeah. So this, um, you know, how, how okay. actually I, I'm going to let you qualify that because you, you can better tease that apart. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, right. So the manufacturing or the, the gel mass preparation process is I think what's being asked about and, um, gelatin can, is really, and I'll reference gelatin because it's, it's, um, what people most commonly know. Um, they really, the equipment used is really a gel melting system for gelatin, where you just add in the materials, you mix under temperature, um, and you're just melting the materials into a gel. Um, with the vegetarian soft capsule systems, it tends to require higher temperature and um, some higher agitation. Um, so the temperature difference would be perhaps gelatin, you're at 60 to 70 Celsius with your molten mass. And um, with a vegetarian system, maybe you're 80 to 90. So it, it is a little bit higher temperature, and it's just due to the nature of the chemistry of the ingredients, um, which has some consideration when you're transferring that to the encapsulation machine. With gelatin, it's a little um, more straightforward to maintain the temperature uh, because you have a good buffer between 75 or, or whatever temperature the gel is and the boiling point of water, whereas with non-animal gels, it tends to be a little tighter. So a tighter control of that temperature is, is typically preferred. 
Well, are there any special requirements for the equipment? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's, uh, we like to say that our CGEL technology um, is adapted to your existing setup and that any adaptations that are made um, just allow you to control the, the temperature uh, and process a little bit better. And those are really critical when we're thinking about operating at higher speeds uh, and achieving that high throughput. Whereas um, there's the a lot of times the equipment that customers have is, is usually acceptable for use um, with, with some small design changes or uh, updates. So no major overhauls are typically required. Um, as I mentioned, it's the same rotary die process. We're making capsules the same way and we're drying them in the same drying chambers and, and tumble dryers. Um, so it's, it tends to not require like a, a whole new extruder setup or anything like that. Fantastic. Um, are, is there any impact at all on shelf life uh, for vegetarian soft gel versus an animal-based soft gel? Um, the, the capsules are themselves are shelf stable, and the uh, um, they are certified for lasting just as long as the uh, gelatin soft capsules and in the grocery store shelf. Um, the one thing I will add is that the non-animal soft capsules uh, tend to be more thermally stable. Mm -hmm. So they'll be more apt to tolerate those higher temperatures on storage and shipping. So this can have um, some implications if you're doing some stability studies on your soft capsules where the gelatin soft capsules would probably melt under accelerated stability conditions. Um, the non-animal soft capsules are, they, they survive temperatures as high as 80 Celsius without having any uh, impact. Um, and that's really due to the nature of the chemistry itself, right? So the carrageenan starch vegetarian soft capsule system we talked about having is processed at a higher temperature. So there's some considerations there on the manufacturing side, but for the, the end product, there are some key, there's a key advantage there with thermal stability. Um, and imagine putting them in, in bulk shipping containers and, and sending them on trucks. They're, they're less liable to melt into one big clump or break upon uh, heating. Well, that's a huge asset um, related to uh, to temperature and stability. Um, what about probiotics? Um, well, first off, I just want to say, you know, of course, if you're, these are vegetarian, if you're vegan, I'm not sure if you're, if, as a consumer, I don't even know if you're taking probiotics since they're alive. Um, but let's just, um, assuming that that's not a consideration, um, how can a probiotic survive during the processing temperature? Um, right. So I, I think I'm not a probiotic expert. Uh, there are some of my colleagues that are, and they can certainly speak to that a little bit better. But uh, there are certain probiotics that can survive such temperatures. Uh, not all, to my knowledge, are, are able to. Um, so it requires careful selection of the probiotic strains. And um, then that is just to survive the injection of the probiotic mixture into the capsule itself. Um, and the, the temperature of the wedge, which has a cavity through the center of it, through which the medicine is injected into the capsule, is not sufficiently high to create a lot of die-off of the probiotics, considering if they're optimally selected. Um, and the, the amount of time that that mixture would stay in the wedge during injection is a fraction of a second. So its exposure to the heat is, isn't what I'd be concerned about. It's, it's more so around the water activity of the soft capsule dosage form and how the probiotic would interact with that because um, potentially it could then just die off because of the, uh, the nature of the dosage form. All right. Um, yeah, we're coming really right up, bumping up to the, to the close of our time here, but we have a few extra minutes. I just want to ask you just a couple of qualitative questions. Uh, first, just generally about uh, carrageenan and 
Um, there were a couple of questions that came in related to uh, perceptions, consumer perceptions, and uh, in certain markets, uh, some consumers have some concern over the health aspects of uh, of purging and, and um, you know, I don't know whether, you know, there's a connect with perception and reality there. I'm not sure. But, you know, that certainly is a perception for some consumers. So um, is there anything you'd like to comment on related to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of the carrageenan perception for, that consumers have is um, when you look into the re the background, it's it's misattributed um, by a another chemistry, a related chemistry uh, of a, a a polymer or a molecule called polygenin, um, and uh, a lot of regulatory bodies, the USDA, um, European regulatory body has verified that carrageenan is safe for use in, in certain formulations. Um, there was a, a recent review done by the USDA um, uh, that I think it was perhaps two, two three years ago um, that recertified carrageenan, having raised a lot of these consumer concerns that said um, that it's, it is still safe and approved for use in organic formulations. Um, because a lot of those concerns, the... Uh, in gut inflammation, carcinogency, are attributed to a, a molecule called polygenin, um, which only can arise when you take naturally occurring carrageenan and you subject it to very high temperature, extremely low pH, like pH 1, like hydrochloric acid pH, uh, for very long periods of time, uh, like six to eight hours. And those three things, they don't happen naturally they won't happen in a soft capsule manufacturing process or any process I'm aware of where carrageenan is used, like food processes. Um, and it, it, uh, that's how you get polygenin. And polygenin has very limited uses. Um, it's used for some imaging stuff in, in the medical field. But um, what people have found is that polygenin does have those, does create those effects, the gut inflammation, the carcinogency. And they were mis, misattributing those that polygenin affects to carrageenan because they're, they're similarly termed. Um, and polygenin is derived from carrageenan in the sense that you have to start with carrageenan and cook it in a lab for a very long period of time. So to sum up, it's not naturally occurring and um, it, it doesn't uh, have any bearing on carrageenan itself. So it seems like that's primarily based on some misinformation and some further education and consumer education is really is really warranted. Yes, there were a couple of studies done in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, which I think started a lot of this concern. Um, but a lot of people have gone back and looked at the the, the characterization of materials and the procedures used and found that they were um, inadequate and didn't really describe that that is in fact carrageenan that the results are based on. So um, a lot of studies have come out since then which have refuted those original studies and asserted that carrageenan is safe and which is further justified by the USDA and European bodies. Well, I'm happy to help educate on the matter with Flight of Foods Insights and Natural Products Insider at our disposal. So um, good, good information. And clearly, we just need to uh, just provide more education on the matter and clarify, you know, this information. Um, I'm going to close up here with and another kind of straightforward qualitative question about um, uh, being able to support uh, claims and certifications. It seems pretty clear that a vegetarian soft gel capsule will be able to support a kosher and halal um, uh, end user claim. Uh, what about um, products that um, are making non-GMO or organic claims? Um, can Are they applicable here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some options, including DuPont Sea Gel, do come with the non-GMO third-party verified status. Um, organic status is on the cutting edge, so to speak. Um, for vegetarian soft capsules, it's it's starting to emerge, um, but only a few select manufacturers have really achieved this. But 
it is possible um, and people are, it is starting to emerge in the marketplace that there are organic soft capsules. Um, so that's kind of an exciting new label claim possibility. That really is, particularly when we saw before that botanicals is one of the um, high ranking product categories uh, that is attracted yeah. delivery format. Yeah, importantly, the, the film material will need to be organic as well. That's, that's an important consideration, but. Right, of course. Um, well, um, again, we're, we're bumped up at the edge of our time here, so I'm, so I'm going to bring us to a conclusion, but I want to remind all of our listeners and viewers today that uh, this will be available on demand uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours, and it will be available on demand for a full year on Vita Foods Insights. I also want to remind everyone that uh, that did uh, submit questions. If we did not get to your question, these questions will be provided to DuPont. Uh, so uh, they have the opportunity to be able to circle back uh, directly with you to support that. And uh, finally, uh, of course, I want to thank you, Ben, for your amazing oh, presentation you. and your knowledge, really. Was fantastic, and especially thank Dupont Nutrition and Biosciences for supporting this content. And um, with that, we'll be signing off. And I want to thank everyone for attending today. And please have a wonderful remainder of your day. Thank you.